the state here because it's 10 years tomorrow since Frederick Valentik disappeared or was taken by a UFO over Bass Strait. Oh, yes, well, I remember that's, that is an intriguing story, actually. I don't know, we've got much time to discuss about it. I, I, would, I desperately no. want to believe in UFOs. I can tell that. But the cases that come up are always a bit sus to me. I mean, why doesn't a UFO just land in the city square? Why do they always sort of do funny little things to people in isolated places? Why, indeed. But you'll find out, Paul. I'll get to the bottom of this one, Doug. <laughs> Paul Barber, with you on 3LO from 7.15 until 10 o'clock tonight, after the 7 o'clock news service. First time I've heard it. It's Ice Cream Days, Jennifer Hall, 3 hello, 8 minutes past 9. Um, we're celebrating, I don't think that's quite the right term actually, we're acknowledging this month, in fact tomorrow, the 10th anniversary of the disappearance of Fred Valentik, the disappearance of he and his Cessna over Bass Strait. The disappearance, as we all know, I think, has become one of the great post-war mysteries, what actually happened. Um, there's a solid body of thought, including his family, which is quite convinced that a UFO, an unidentified flying object, was involved in uh, Valentich's disappearance in some way. And as I say, it's 10 years tomorrow since it all happened. So in the studio tonight, I have with me a 70-year-old man by the name of Paul Norman. He will be familiar to those of you who are interested in UFOs. Uh, he's made it really his life mission, researching UFO cases around the world. He is obviously a believer in UFOs, and uh, although he does admit that there have been a lot of frauds. Uh, he's Vice President of the UFO Research Society here in Victoria. Paul Norman, good evening and thanks for coming in. My pleasure. Now, let's uh, start with the Valentic case because it's uh, 10 years tomorrow. Uh, just let's recap. W w what do you say happened? Well, he was on his way to King Island to get uh, crayfish. And uh, soon after he left the lighthouse vicinity at the Cape Otway, uh, he thought he saw an airplane in the area, and he inquired to the traffic controller uh, and uh, who informed him that uh, there was no traffic in the area. <clears throat> but as the object came closer, he saw that it wasn't. He saw that it was a long shape, a metallic appearance, and uh, uh, it had a maneuverability that he couldn't estimate the speed and he reported his engine coughing, or idling, like uh, this electromagnetic effect, which is a characteristic of UFO throughout the world when they close the ignition system, radio, t uh, TV. And uh, one of his last statements was this strange object was hovering over him and it was not an aircraft. And uh, there was a mystery sound that interrupted the transmission you know, after that we don't know what happened he started to say Melbourne something and then this uh, uh, sound and it's never been explained now the, 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 this conversation of course uh, with control was taped do you believe we've heard all the tape I I think we have uh, the uh, Department of Transport never did release a sound portion of the tape no. although they gave the trans the transcript, transcript. And uh, the father listened to the uh, tape uh, to identify his son's voice, whether it was, and and he seems to think that it was all there. Now, you're not just convinced that it was uh, a UFO in his case because of what, what was said, because you believe that there have been other cases, don't you, similar, very similar to this? Uh, that's correct. We, we compare this with other, uh, other cases. Uh, we have a case of a helicopter pilot over Ohio um, who was describing the same sort of an object that Valentich was describing. Uh, maneuverability, long shape, with a green light that Federick was, was describing. Well, Mr. Norman, you, you brought in a tape of yeah. some of the conversation. Now, this is between the helicopter pilot and who? Uh, this was this was a the helicopter uh, pilot telling yeah. about his experience. Not this, not about him. His experience. It's, it's he's him talking about what he that's saw. That's right. All right. Let's have him do a couple of minutes of it, and then we'll, we'll comment on it afterwards. Trained military personnel with thousands of hours of flying time behind me. What occurred next might seem like science fiction, but it happened. My last look at my altimeter was. and the other helicopter was 3,500 feet, flying at the 
description there by the uh, Ohio helicopter pilot who obviously survived the, the experience. The four-man crew, they yeah. got back to tell about their experience in Frederick Will Intensity Dock. Right. Now, but what do you, what, what is, what is the similar, similarities there between that tape and, uh, and Valenti? Well, we have wondered, uh, especially since uh, some of these other cases, like the nose car being picked up and all that, was this sound, the sound latching on to the aircraft? And uh, his description was, 19 other descriptions, uh, they all are saying that they harmonize with each other. Mm. Because you say there are about 20 such cases similar to Frederick Valentich. Uh, yes, some of them we know they have crashed, and others that uh, just disappeared. We don't know whether it went up or down or disintegrated. We know of one, one case that actually dis disintegrated the plane when a, when a UFO was nearby. In fact, it had fired on the UFO. All right. Now, well, the obvious question uh, to this, and, and, and the general sort of um, question, I suppose, arising out of all these cases, I mean, why do these UFOs only seem to come in sort of isolated cases, where someone like Fred Valentich is, is seemingly on his own, away from other people? I mean, why doesn't a UFO land in the in the city square here in Melbourne and say, well, here we are? Well, I'd have to know what the motive is before I could answer that. I don't know the, the weather, whence and why, but uh, there have been hundreds of people see them at the time around the cities in those areas, but uh, these strange cases are taking place in isolated areas where they come down on the ground and, and uh, uh, do these things... Uh, we don't know. We don't know why that is. Because that's what uh, you know uh -huh. creates the problem. Where people say, "Well, I don't say." They say, "Well, I don't believe Paul Norman. I don't believe Frederick. What Frederick Valentik said. I mean, why? Why can't we just say, "Well, look, Frederick Valentik, unfortunately, crashed his plane and best right." Well, uh, there wasn't anything uh, floating in what he was describing. What the other people had said. There's some theory. Uh, one of the theories is that they gradually reveal in their their uh, presence. So we won't have a culture shock. That's speculation. I don't know, but we do know that they uh, they don't like to be public. These strange cases are taking place in isolated areas. The UFOs don't like to be too public. Well, I, that's just uh, obviously they're not. What their what their motive would be, I wouldn't know. Now you have seen a UFO. Yes, that's what got me interested. Back in 1953, I saw an object. Uh, I was in of a power station. Whereabouts was this? This was in Tennessee. Right. And I was called outside to see what it was. I thought it was a night flying helicopter. It's approaching, coming up the river below the the uh, power station, about the speed of a helicopter. And when it got over the station, it stopped for about a half minute, and then it sped away. It was as fast, at least as fast as a jet, with no sound. But how big was it? About the size of a helicopter? Uh. Or bigger than that? I, I'd say it was a circular, it was a circular object. It's just to estimate, I would say, uh, it's about 30 feet in diameter. Mm, did it have lights? Yes, a uh, whitish blue light, uh, blinking on off, or pulsating about once a second, change dim bright, dim bright. Mm. And were you scared when this happened? No, I was all, uh, awestruck. Uh, I was uh, astonished. No, I wasn't scared. In fact, uh, I thought that, uh, well, perhaps the wind is blowing the sound away from me. And uh, when I saw it in November in Tennessee, uh, that's wintertime, of course, uh, when I got the tip end of the blades of grass, dry grass, flipped it up, and what a little breeze it was, was going my way. And yet there was no sound? I didn't hear any, no sound, but the people that have been near them, they, they report a sound similar to a humming transformer and some... Uh, swishing sound sometimes, but they have to be very close to these objects. Now, also, when all this happened to you, I mean, did you say to yourself, oh, look, you know, Paul, don't be stupid, you know, there's, there's mm -hmm. some physical 
uh, extrapolation of this as some sort of funny lighting or... Yes, no, I, 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 tried, I tried to think of all this, but uh, then I started, naturally I started paying attention to the reports, started interviewing people. The best reports come from airline pilots, um, daytime sightings that is, and invariably in the daytime they're dull silver or aluminum color. Uh, we think that uh, they possibly have uh, something like your wristwatch, dial on your wristwatch, it, it, it doesn't track the attention until after dark, you don't see this light. However, that is only uh, a, a theory. Mm. So, so the, once this has happened to you and then you notice other reports and you felt, God, there's some there's similarities between what I saw and heard. Now, did, did you actually report your specific sighting? Did you try and report your case to anybody? Uh, I told the people I, I worked with, I was telling them about, there were several reports along about that time. And uh, and uh, that same month, there was a, a pilot, two, two airmen disappeared while they were uh, uh, investigating a UFO case. It happened to Ken Ross, near Ken Ross Air Force Base in Michigan. The, the object was first detected by radar and they had one interceptor on the, at the base and they scrambled it. They reported this, uh, this uh, object and uh, as they got closer to it, uh, the first a lot of static on the radio and then it faded all together. But the radar uh, they had the blip of the UFO on the radar and the right. blip of the interceptor approaching. And uh, when they, they merged, the two blips merged for yeah. about 20 seconds. And then, uh, then, they, Oops. Yeah, that's right. then they took off, they searched the area like the like Lindage uh, for about three weeks. And nothing was ever no, found. No. Nothing was ever found. Well, little did I dream uh, back in November uh, 1953 that I'd involved in the great this mystery in, in Australian aviation history. And of course you've spent, uh, since that time, 1953, you spent uh, most of your years traveling around the world looking at... No, no, I, I was uh, in the power stations until 1976 doing this part-time. Right. But after that, uh, I, I opted for early retirement to do it this full-time. It's become an obsession? Well, some people say, some people say compulsion, some obsession. Depending on whether my friend or foe. Because mm. I mean, I'm sure you've been called, you know, a nut and a crank by by, me, by many people. How do you react to that? Uh, well, that that doesn't bother me. These, these, these usually come from people that don't know what's going on. Mm. The real low green men are humans, who are so green. In fact, they don't realize something's going on that they don't understand. They are the real little green men. As far as uh, green men from outer space, I've been investigating now uh, for for 35 years, and I know investigators, personally claimed uh, uh, investigators all over the world, and I never heard of one one uh, case of a little green man. The only little green men I know are, of are humans who, so green they don't realize something is going on that they don't understand. All right, now ca can we move our attention to uh, uh, the situation, I think it was out in the um, Nullarbor, the family that came from Perth and were coming to Melbourne by car this is earlier this year. What, you, I think you went out there to have a look at their car, didn't you? Uh, yes, when it got to Adelaide, we went uh, we went out and uh, and we interviewed the family. So well, the they, Knowles family was the Knowles family. Yes, that's right. When they got to Melbourne, and uh, Faye Knowles, who had reached on top with her arm covered, yes, that's us. right. When uh, she, by the time she got to Melbourne, her arm was swelling, and and I suspected that it was some sort of temporary radiation. Uh, but uh, we, uh, a colleague and I, John Ocatel, we went out to examine the car when it got to Adelaide. And uh, the driver, uh, he thought he was doing 200 k's to get out from under the object. He didn't realize he was in the air until it dropped back. And he reported 200 k's. Uh, it's speedo full scale. Of course, that car won't go 200 uh, k's on the ground. But what we did was jack up the front wheels when we got out there. It's a front wheel drive. And those wheels will spin at 200 k's full scale, which tied in precisely as what he said. So you that, believe that? That, 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 that was, that was uh, uh, documented by Channel 7. That's right. right. Now, you believe that, family. You believe it was a U.S. It, it, it all ties in. And I took the dust. I took the dust samples. And we vacuumed out of the car. 
back to the States with him, and, and a retired scientist from NASA had uh, submitted it to the Phillips uh, Laboratory, right. a high technology laboratory, and it was not brake dust. And uh, what this, was it? Well, the, among other things, uh, uh, oxygen, uh, silicon. But the, the most uh, interesting part was the uh, indication that it could have been astatine. Now, astatine has a half-life when it's uh, when it's first uh, uh, split up atomic elements. Uh, for example, uh, it was first synthetically produced in, Cal in California University by bombarding Bisbeth with uh, helium nuclei. And when that action takes place, it's slightly radioactive, but it has a half-life of, of uh, seven or eight hours. And by the time they had got to, to uh, Seduna, and where it was checked by the police for radiation, naturally it would then decay. But I recently found, after I went back there, I found uh, another gentleman who uh, went to that area about an hour after it happened and uh, picked up the sort of fiber stuff on it, about a quarter of a mile it spread it along the highway. And between his fingers it crumbled in uh, uh, something that resembled, uh, uh, well, some, some sort of acid, uh, some sort of graphite, graphite. But it was so light the wind was, was blowing it away. And then one week later, one week later, it's important, he come the, came, broke out the same symptoms as, uh, as uh, Faye knows, only he was ad admitted to the hospital a few days later. And we're trying to now to get the two doctors together with his permission to see, to try to determine if this is what happened. Well, it's a strange case. So is uh, Frederick Valentik. Um, it's, well, the whole thing is just fascinating. I just wish we just knew a little bit more. But that's, uh, that's what you've uh, dedicated the rest of your life to, to finding out more about UFOs. Now, you're interested in people. Uh, getting in touch with you, want to uh, either talk to you about uh, various things that they might have seen, ask you uh, whether in fact they may have seen UFOs, or in fact uh, join your society. So your box number is, if people want to contact you, P.O. Box 43, that's right, is it? Moravan 3189. All right, and, and we will keep their names confidential if they're so so. Is All right, so if they've got any queries about it, or if they want to belong to the society, or if they've had an experience which they feel uh, you should know something about. Well, uh, how are you? Well, tomorrow is not really celebration day, is it? How will you spend tomorrow? Uh, on the telephone, talking uh, to uh, other people, and we've got calls coming in pretty often now where I am about the case, asking questions about it. Mm. Ten years tomorrow since Frederick Van Entick disappeared. All right, Paul Norman, thank you very much indeed for coming in tonight. My pleasure, thank you.